Hello, I'm Ushma Neal with the Journal of Clinical Investigation, here today for another of our conversations with giants in medicine. I'm joined today by Alexander Sasha Rudensky from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He has made profound impact in the world of immunology through his study and research of regulatory T cells. In an ongoing series of landmark studies, Rudensky has defined the factors that identify and differentiate these cells. Furthermore, he's demonstrated the critical roles that regulatory T cells play in autoimmunity, tolerance, allergy, infections, cancer, and metabolic disorders. Thank you so much for joining me today, Sasha. Thank you, Ushma. Glad to be here. Can you start by telling me a little bit about your parents and where you grew up? I grew up in Moscow. Um, I was born uh, in the very beginning of Khrushchev Spring in 1956, uh, the pivotal year uh, when at the 20th Congress of Communist Party of Soviet Union, Khrushchev denounced at least some of the crimes committed by Stalin. Um, my father uh, was uh, Recruited well, he um, uh, he didn't finish high school when the war started, um, and enrolled into the army. Ended up being in uh, artillery school uh, at the age of seventeen, and after graduation, he was bringing ammunition to uh, France as a junior officer uh, in Soviet army to all kind of different fronts. Um, after the war, uh, he ended up being as a, essentially a bureaucrat working in Ministry of Interior uh, dealing with prisoners of war and during the purge of Jews uh, in '49, from Interior Ministry and any other security, state security affiliated entities, uh, he um, uh, ended up going back to school uh, and finishing uh, high school and uh, going on to become an engineer. And after he finished uh, his um, technical, so basically uh, in school of in in engineering school studies, he was working uh, in one of many um, so-called PO boxes, uh, enterprises um, dealing with development of weapons and missiles, and he was specifically involved in developing gyroscopes. Uh, and at some point he retired, he moved on and became a, a bureaucrat in Soviet Academy of Sciences um, and on the side to make some extra income he was editing uh, books and mathematics and physics um, and, but mostly focusing on space flights and everything around uh, missiles, rockets. Um, my mother uh, was 16 when the war started. Um, her family was evacuated and ended up in Ural Mountains where my grandfather died um, and left my grandmother and my mother and my uncle alone away from Moscow. So it was a difficult period. They came back uh, in 1944 to Moscow. She finished Moscow University Law School. Uh, at that time, a law profession was also um, difficult, um, and that was also the time of um, uh, doctor's trials, and not necessarily the best time for uh, uh, a Jewish, young Jewish woman to practice law. Uh, she ended up being um, a teacher uh, of Russian Russian literature in school, uh, and she got a second education um, and became teacher of Russian Russian literature. And in your home, you were encouraged both to read Russian literature as well as engage in the mathematics and science that your father was so fond of. Uh, science was uh, 
greatly respected in Soviet Union. Um, and scientists do belong to a group of so-called noble professions uh, in uh, Soviet Union. Um, they were admired. Also, natural sciences and mathematics was one of the area of um, uh, uh, of uh, one of the occupations uh, that were relatively relatively free of ideology and uh, to a larger degree uh, allowed for merit-based uh, advances and pursuit of, of, of interest. So in, in some ways uh, it, it was uh, not an unusual path. Also, I was growing up at the time where uh, fascination with science uh, was widespread, at least in, in Soviet Union, but I think in this country as well. Everywhere. So I remember uh, not quite being not quite five years old uh, when I heard on the radio a uh, report of the first space flight Gagarin flew. Um, and, and that was totally amazing. It was truly amazing and I remember the change of, of fascination from astronomy to physics to biology with some delay uh, uh, among Soviet children and then Soviet public at large. So it was both expected of you that science would be your profession, but you also were partly motivated by the, the changes in the science world that were happening around you. Yeah, I think it's both. It's sort of social circumstances that allow for really lesser choice if to think about the choices, uh, but also the culture, uh, the social status, uh, and the interest. Mm -hmm. So all together. And I don't think I was that gifted in, uh, in writing uh, uh, or dance. But then what put you on the path towards going to university and studying science and pursuing a PhD? Uh, going to the university was also a pretty standard way. Uh, kids would not think, especially boys, not think of other ways. But to think of going to university, alternative was being conscripted um, to the army. Uh, at the age of 18. Imagine myself at some point a mathematician. I uh, won, well, got second uh, in regional mathematics Olympiad, but I think that was early on and I figured out that I'm not as good at math as I thought I was. Um, became interested with my friends um, in botany. We were, went to Botanical Garden of Academy of Sciences and tried to volunteer there. And, and I, so I, sixth, seventh grade. And then I got interested in chemistry. And I, actually, I was thinking that I will be a chemist. And from seventh grade to tenth grade, I was really, very much uh, interested in chemistry. I read a little vignette that you and your friend started making fireworks when you got interested in chemistry. These were not even fireworks, just explosives. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there, there, were, there were stores selling chemical reagents um, in Moscow, and they were selling them to schools or to organizations. Uh, but anyone could come in and buy salts. Uh, I don't think that dangerous chemicals were easily sold there. but. We were collecting some of uh, sort of pocket money uh, from what we were getting for uh, school breakfast or lunch and buying reagents and, and yeah, trying to make explosives but also uh, sort of colorful and sometimes stinky chemical reactions. Um, in the apartments, in the apartments we were asked to go out by our parents, uh, mostly in courtyards and sometimes um, in our apartment buildings by the elevator. So this led to perhaps thought, chemistry, this could be for me. Yeah, that's right. So I enrolled in evening chemistry school uh, past the rather 
difficult entrance exam. Um, uh, even in chemistry school, um, at the Depart Faculty of Chemistry of Moscow State University, and that was pretty amazing because it's, uh, um, graduate students uh, and professors of Faculty of Chemistry were teaching uh, high school children uh, in the evening, so that would be three, four hours in the evening, three, four times a week, uh, and that included lab work. Mm -hmm. Synthesis, uh, analytical chemistry. I loved organic synthesis. Um, loved the uh, all the amazing glassware uh, that was involved in it. Um, but then, by by the time I was finishing high school and thinking of applying uh, for uh, just going to the university, I found chemistry a little bit dry and started thinking of biochemistry instead of chemistry. So I entered a uh, department of biochemistry, a faculty of medical biology, which was a somewhat experimental uh, program um, at second uh, Moscow school, second medical school uh, in, in Moscow, uh, where uh, the idea was to combine uh, basic molecular cell biology, biophysics, um, and later computational biology, although it was called at that time biocybernetics, uh, with some exposure to clinical medicine. So I entered this, um, um, this program. Um, it was a six-year program. Uh, so my um, degree is in biochemistry, so it was uh, probably equivalent of master degree in biochemistry. Then what led to a PhD and how did you fixate on immunology for a PhD? Right, so well then next I found biochemistry a bit dry and towards the midst of my studies at the university and I, I worked one summer in the immunology lab that was cellular immunology lab um, at the university and then the next uh, fall, I uh, got in touch uh, with the head of immunochemistry lab in one of the research institutes of Academy of Medical Sciences in Moscow. And I started working uh, in the evenings and sometimes taking time uh, from uh, classes and summers and weekends. And then I did my uh, master thesis in, in this laboratory, and that was immunochemistry laboratory. Uh, the project that I was involved aimed to map interaction sites of uh, uh, staphylococcal protein A with immunoglobulin molecule uh, using enzymatic methods and methods of protein fractionation. So it was essentially biochemistry but uh, focused on immune molecules. So that was closer to interest. But then, uh, then after I finished my master's degree. Um, uh, this uh, person I was working with by the name Alexander Kulberg uh, wanted me to stay um, for graduate studies. Uh, that didn't work. I, I was told that in part of it sort of there was some kind of limits for um, um, Jewish um, uh, boys and girls uh, at some universities and in the hindsight it was very fortunate uh, because I end up working with Vitaly Yurin uh, and doing more sort of mainstream immunology rather than immunochemistry and I was much happier in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this area. So what was the focus of your PhD? The focus of my PhD was um, antigen presentation and processing of uh, molecules synthesized by B lymphocytes. Uh, it's, the theme seems to be a bit obscure, but at that time in the lab we were fascinated uh, with the mystery of T cell receptor uh, at that time and I started uh, in the lab in 1979. Uh, immunoglobulin gene was cloned um, by Tanigawa, 
diversity was known, but how T cell receptor works, how does it recognize antigen wasn't clear, and, and that was really fascinating. I spent summer after graduation from the university before I um, came to the lab, uh, sitting with my uh, daughter, first child who was born on the day of graduation from uh, university, reading pile of xerocopied papers uh, from uh, Cold Spring Harbor meetings, uh, from Nature, Cell Science, meetings, reports, big pile. This was my first exposure, really major exposure to English. My first foreign language was German. Uh, uh, and I found it absolutely fascinating. And that was all about uh, differentiation of T cells, um, phenomenon known in immunology, MHC restriction. And the major uh, unknown was T cell receptor, the structure, specificity, selection of it. And so at some point you got to go to Germany to present your work and attend an international immunology conference. That's right. Uh, it was uh, a major surprise. This huge development, uh, uh, well, huge, enormous change uh, that occurred in Soviet Union between, I would say, 87 and 89. Uh, during garbage of years, I was, I never thought that I would be able to go anywhere to cross the border of Soviet Union unless I would decide on immigration to Israel or United States. Uh, but then um, from 87 on, um, over the span of two years, amazing change that happened. Uh, the borders became open and it became possible to travel. So my trip to West Germany and West Berlin just before the fall of Berlin Wall in 89 was striking. That was my first trip to the West and before I only, uh, I think in 86, I visited Bulgaria and as, as a part of a business trip where my passport was stolen. And, and the KGB officer in charge of the institute I was working at told me that my passport is in the hands of uh, uh, CIA and, and I would never cross the border or even come close to the border of Soviet Union. And that was 86. Gorbachev was already in power, so I, I thought I was convinced that it would never happen in my lifetime. Uh, but uh, life is full of surprises. So what did that experience kindle in you? Was that the reason why you reached out to a faculty member in the United States to think about coming to the States for a postdoc? I went to uh, Berlin to the Congress and also I visited Max Planck Institute in Freiburg. At, uh, I was invited by Michael Rath, member of the Institute whom I met when he visited Moscow. Um, and as a result, I was invited by George Keller, late George Keller, who was director of Max Planck. Uh, George uh, received Nobel Prize for his uh, invention together with Caesar Milstein of hybridoma, monoclonal antibody technology. So I was invited to come to work in George's lab, and uh, that what we wanted to, to do, to come uh, and first to, for myself to be exposed to much more diverse and exciting science to learn something else and I thought we would go for a couple of years. And another thing that um, there was a, a paranoia that this incredible pace of change would end up in uh, dictatorship, uh, in terror on a scale of Stalin type terror. Uh, that was always on the minds of people. Uh, I think my generation was relatively, but relatively relieved, uh, but I, my parents were clearly uh, uh, affected by, uh, by their exposure, by, by living through, through these years. So uh, we thought that 
we will go for two, three years. Um, it will be a fantastic experience and, and um, dust will settle. That was very stupid. Dust will settle and then we'll figure out, we'll come back. Uh, for some bizarre bureaucratic reasons, um, I was unable to get a working German visa um, to go with my family to work for two, three years in Germany with George. And uh, at this point you have four children? I had three children, but the number four was on, on his way, so it was sort of time pressure in a way to go before uh, our uh, youngest son uh, was born. Um, so I wrote a letter to Charlie Janeway. Um, uh, he never met me, I never met him. Um, and uh, through a friend of mine who was at the time in Columbus, Ohio, and sent my letter to Charlie from Columbus, uh, I was, he told me to call Charlie. So I called him and um, first thing he said, when do you want to come, which was uh, stunning. Um, and uh, that was in November. Um, and uh, he asked whether I would want to come before Christmas or after Christmas. Wow. So we, we came uh, in the end of February. Why Janeway? And then further to that, you know, he's notorious for his wit, for his intellect, for his sense of humor. So what are the things that you learned from him during that time, even beyond the immunology? Um, it was great to, and it, it was enormous luck. It was really, uh, I was very lucky and very fortunate and very grateful to Charlie for taking risk that I don't know whether I would ever take um, of inviting someone he never met. Um, he may have seen a few papers that I published out of Moscow in the European Journal of Immunology, which was unusual uh, for Soviet immunologist. Um, but may, I don't know, maybe he hasn't seen them. But he took a risk uh, um, in inviting me. I think besides uh, being a fantastic writer uh, and his writing and his reviews were the ones that attracted me, um, I think his unique feature was synthetic and very biological way of thinking of uh, immunological or biological problems, bringing in um, facts, findings, and concepts uh, from different areas of biology. So the, his fascination with generating new concepts and new ideas, which were sometimes wrong, ought to be wrong, but Sometimes they were so right and profound uh, that that these ideas changed the way uh, modern immunologists uh, thinking of fairly basic principles how the immune system operates. And so you decided to move to Seattle for your first position. So, right. first off, why stay in the U.S.? And second off, why the University of Washington? Well, I think the choices were either to go back to Moscow, um, but uh, I, at that time, actually, uh, our fears of potential oppression did materialize. There, were, there was a coup. Um, Soviet Union stopped uh, being uh, stopped kind of big, big, big existence of Soviet Union uh, ceased, ceased to exist. Um, and 92 in Soviet Union, in, in post-Soviet Russia, was extremely difficult time where people literally didn't have food. And the way country and the directions country were go was going was not particularly appealing. So it's not that we decided that we'll stay permanently. I think that the 
fact that the realization that my family and I are going to stay in the United States uh, permanently came much, much later. We always felt like, well, maybe a few more years and then we'll see, maybe we'll go back at that time. So I, I don't think that there was any question in terms of science that staying in the United States is the way of staying in science. If we were to go back to Moscow, it's not for doing science, it's for other reasons, family, culture, language, mm -hmm. um, loyalty. Uh, so I think there, there was no question about it. Um, Seattle, um, I, didn't, I didn't want to go for interviews in a way Charlie one day brought a letter from Roger Perlmutter from University of Washington. Roger was uh, chairman of newly established Department of Immunology. I think it started in 89, um, uh, 90. Uh, to Charlie soliciting applicants uh, for assistant professor position. And uh, Charlie gave me this letter and told um, Roger that I will be a good candidate. And that was less than two, it, it was end of 91, so it was less than two years I've been in his lab. By that time I had two well-published papers. Um, and I gave a talk in Charlie's place at the meeting in Italy, uh, in coma, and um, I think a couple of people in attendance uh, took notice and also told Roger of that. So I, this was my first interview. I, didn't, I was not inclined to go out for interview. I interviewed in Seattle, I interviewed also at NYU, uh, where I also got an offer. But Seattle was amazing, was amazing city, uh, was amazing department, small young department, uh, but um, incredibly uh, exciting. So what did you set about studying once you did establish your laboratory there? Well, I continued with some of the work I was doing in Charlie's lab, I ended up doing working on antigen processing and presentation, sort of by using a bit more biochemical slash chemical approaches than the ones uh, I was using uh, back in Moscow. Um, so I needed to continue with some of the same work, but I was always uh, been fascinated with T-cell differentiation, uh, the way T-cell specificity is shaped, uh, and I extended our studies of antigen processing and presentation uh, to effects of antigen processing uh, on uh, repertoire of T cells and T cell differentiation and uh, development. Okay. How did your science pivot over time though? Because the things that have gotten you noticed of late have been largely more related to regulatory T cells. Right. So it's um, the field of antigen processing and presentation uh, peaked um, in terms of exciting biological questions. Uh, in late 80s, early 90s, uh, and I felt that uh, from just biological understanding, from major, from the point of view, major biological concepts, um, the field of antigen presentation became increasingly dry with most of the questions that remained in the field, at least in the area I was working in were mostly cell biological questions. Is machinery the way cell or machine works to put out uh, these molecules that uh, present the antigens to cells of the immune system? Uh, so I really wanted to address more biologically exciting questions in a way when 
perhaps some of the bigger concepts or concept, concepts can be thought of. There were several factors that contributed. I had a fantastic postdoctoral fellow who joined my lab at the time, and uh, he was interested in uh, regulatory T cells that were characterized um, several years ago uh, by Shimon Sakaguchi. Uh, before that time, in '95, um, Shimon Sakaguchi published this uh, uh, groundbreaking paper um, reporting uh, cell surface markers of the cells. Um, and uh, so Mark was interested in the cells. It was Mark Gavin's first paper um, a study, and his studies and then first paper on regulatory T cells that convinced us that the cells represent a distinct lineage of cellular differentiation and where we thought to start looking for specific mechanisms that um, govern their differentiation and, and function genetic mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Say we would this idea that if you find genetic mechanism of differentiation and function of the cells, uh, then we would be able to understand exciting biology. And biology was exciting because I think um, this phenomenon of regulation of activity of cells of the immune system by a dedicated population of cells uh, represents sort of un an unparalleled negative principle of negative regulation in biology. Is there anything that regulatory T cells can't do? Because for the last, I guess, 20 years now, you've been discovering a multitude of things that they do. Their involvement in maternal fetal tolerance, their involvement within infection and autoimmunity, now within cancer, metabolic diseases, the communication with the microbiome. So is this all just low-hanging fruit or is there more yet to come from Tregs? Uh, probably more. I, th I think that um, What, what we don't know is, um, is, is the way different cell types um, of different systems, uh, that is cells belonging to the immune system, uh, connective tissue, uh, parenchymal cells, neurons uh, interact with each other in a complex environment of an organ and tissue during organ development, uh, during uh, changes in uh, physiological function or in disease. Uh, and that, I think, represents a major uh, problem uh, that need to be understood, means of communication, uh, bringing this together with new knowledge, with new tools, uh, with rather deep understanding of individual cell type bringing together into the context of, say, 19th century physiology, physiology of an organism, physiology of organ. What is your approach to mentoring? So I took the trouble to speak with a couple of your current and former trainees, and the first thing that they all said was that you're the best mentor that they've ever had. So what is it that makes your trainees so devoted to you? I bribe them. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> so I, my approach is, is a midwife approach. Uh, so I... Uh, I'm trying to help, but not to, uh, but uh, not to intervene and interfere with their own growth. Uh, uh, I'm trying to give them as much uh, intellectual and experimental space um, as as they can handle, um, and just with questions um, and discussions, try to facilitate 
their own process and their own growth. Um, I believe that um, at the stage of uh, postdoctoral fellows in particular, but also graduate students, uh, I think independence, independent thinking ability to take initiative uh, and to think big is, uh, is the key for their success. One of your former trainees is specifically mentioned the fact that you are better read than any of the rest of them, better traveled, more cultured. You mentioned your love of opera. So clearly your dedication to science has not kept you from a passion for other things. I'm afraid this is uh, to a large degree baggage from my uh, years in Soviet Union uh, because I, I think the professional life or even scientific life was less intense uh, in terms of demands of time. Uh, you can spend all your time thinking of scientific problems, but if you don't spend all your time, but you read, say, philosophy books uh, or history books or um, um, became interested in architecture uh, or um, Chinese history, you were able to do it and still sort of succeed on some scale. I think the intensity of professional life in the United States in particular uh, does uh, put so much pressure on practicing scientists, especially young scientists, that there is a danger of people growing more one-dimensional in a way. Uh, but it's, I think it's very enriching to be more well-rounded and be aware of literature and music. Absolutely and agreed. Art. Yeah. If you could not be a scientist, what other career do you think would have kept you so dedicated? Counselor. Why? Um, I like people. Thank you very much for joining me today, Sasha. I really appreciated hearing a little bit more about your background and your motivations. Thank you, Ushma.